Cheers, Mike. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. It's a um, pleasure to come and join you and share a little bit about kind of Hope Street. Um, it will be a sort of joint presentation between myself um, and Paul. Um, I was previously a director at Snug Architects and led the design team on Hope Street. And Paul is the, the founding director of Snug Architects, who will talk more about the design for the sort of second half. Um, what we will look to cover is a bit about the sort of the vision and process you know what do what was what was the brief what do we aim to achieve um what has been the sort of the target um of this sort of trauma-informed kind of project what is trauma-informed design and then paul's going to explain a little bit about well, how how has it changed what's the difference between this and, a, and another project where has that really hit the road and doug will talk a little bit about uh, the sustainable aspects um, having contributed and been the sort of the lead on the project for for the engineering sort of uh, and mechanical discipline and then we'll have some questions so the client and um, the client's one small thing they are a charity um that was founded by lady edwina edwina grosner and she had a um a passion to change the and improve the justice system for kind of for, for women. Um, her view is that the justice system is often designed around men. The female prison population is proportionately very, very small. And many of the women who are in, um, uh, in custody are often in for very short sentences and have often had an experience of their own sort of trauma that has been part of their journey to get there. And the, and the justice system doesn't particularly work well for them. So sh they have been trying to educate within women's prisons across the country, lobbying for change. And Hope Street has been their, um, their project to redesign and rethink what would be possible um, if you know, in their belief that the prison system doesn't work well for, for women and doesn't create good outcomes. So Hope Street, is their pilot project. It's their blueprint to try and change things. And it's a residential environment for women who probably shouldn't have a custodial sentence, but often there is no, um, there is no place for them. Um, and there's often no safe place for them at home for them to, to, to undertake a, com um, a community sentence. And therefore they're up tariffs to prison um, and that sometimes comes at the consequence that if they have children with them, their children will be taken away because it, it becomes a custodial sentence, even though the custodial sentence might be sort of six weeks. Um, and that then creates generational trauma and consequences for the individuals and for, for, for society. And therefore, how can Hope Street and One Small Thing offer women who are shouldn't be in the justice system an opportunity to deal with some of their ex experience trauma and find a positive cycle upwards rather than descending a negative sort of cycle that could be avoided. They, a lot of their work is around dealing with the kind of core issues and how has, uh, how have people ended up into this, into the, the justice system what has created this one and trying to deal with the root problems rather than dealing with the, the symptoms of, uh, of what is discussed. So they look at these kind of five core trauma and values and Paul will probably pick up on some of these aspects as he, as he goes through where our design has made a difference. But these are the values that have underpinned once more things work, which we then brought into how do we design a building to facilitate their, their service. So very quickly, before to give a framework for what the building is, it is located in Southampton, covers Hampshire. It has a residential um, capacity for up to 24 women and their ch children and is uh, not a prison. It is a community alternative. So where women might do community service in their own home, but this provides something which a safe place for them, particularly those who might be experiencing um, domestic violence or other similar situations. It's made up of two buildings, a front building, which we call the hub, where the various sort of therapies and, and offices um, are located, and then the rear residential building, which Paul will cover a little bit more kind of later on. So that's the overview, and that just gives you a little bit of a context of kind of what we're talking about. 
the design process. So it was very interesting to, to think because this project is unique in the sense that it's not been sort of tried before and therefore the client took quite a bold decision at the beginning not to jump straight into the to the design but actually to start to flesh out what is the design what 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 could this building be how would it work how would they achieve the service that they're trying to revolutionize in, in into a building and they brought in um heatherwick studio who created an illustrated brief that was called a design guide but it basically took the ambition that um one small thing were trying to uh, to achieve and started to say well what would be the building that be, um that would house that and how would that contribute positively how would it be a healing environment how would it allow people to leave you know in a better place than kind of when they arrived what would that look like and how do you how do you start from a blank sheet of paper rather than migrate um a prison and then say well how could we make it a little bit better but it's to really sweep that aside and start from kind of first principles and that really helped the client understand what they were trying to achieve and certainly gave us as architects entering the project and the um, the rest of the design team a real kind of uh, teeth to to get to grips with um so that was that was a, a very important part of the the process in receiving this um kind of design guide and kind of illustrated brief we we looked at the what they were trying to achieve um, and felt like there was um, a number of aspects that intuitively we, we felt was was important, that it would be a restorative environment. There would be um, needing to be places for sanctuary. You know, people, the women would arrive there potentially in a, in a, a relatively emotional state, having come straight from court and, um, uh, and the magistrate's sentencing. Um, and they would need they would need space to be alone. But increasingly, they would also need space to be in community to sort of together. The women would spend up to sort of three months at sort of Hope Street. So it forms a small community. And part of Hope Street's objectives is for the women to start to live in community again when some of those kind of relationships um, and trust has been kind of broken down. And to do that, we felt we would need an informal um, environment rather than an institutional environment um which would which is more kind of an institu institutional environment feeling like it would be more depersonalized and etc and um key one would be how do how does a building how does a service build trust with these women who arrive whose trust levels is probably very low and in order to engage with them that was going to be a key point that the building would need to um to need to restore as we then got into the project, we then started asking ourselves the question, well, you know, what, what is trauma? What does that really look like? And how do we understand that? How do we understand and put ourselves in the position of, uh, of those who would have experienced this? Um, um, and so we did some of our understanding around what are people's responses to those things? What is What are the triggers? How do you actually treat sort of trauma um, through both counselling and talking approaches, but also, you know, often um, physical regulation sort of techniques around breathing techniques and those things. And, and therefore, what is happening in this building and how do we actually accommodate um, th these things? We were also helped hugely by the fact that one small thing themselves have undertaken their own research work with sort of academic partners who deal with sort of trauma and have their own experience for over 10 15 years of working with women in prisons and therefore they they very much understood that the 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 end users and the women who'd be resident um and they then facilitated workshops um which were really beneficial and quite key for this project was appointing the design team early we often you often have a, a design project where the architecture is is appointed 
And once you get further through the kind of risk aspects, the rest of the consultant design team are appointed to try and bring their their bearing and their advice. But we were very fortunate that both the landscape architect and the interior architect were appointed right at the very beginning. And we were able to run these workshops as a very kind of collaborative kind of process, appreciating well, our responses to buildings are based on our own experience. But for a woman who's experienced trauma and experienced possibly prisons previously in other institutional environments, they would respond to the architecture in very different ways. Um, so we ran two workshops, or two, two series of workshops um, with, with women firstly posing the question, well, how would you react to these ideas? What would, how would this feel like? Asking some very kind of big questions. And then we ran a second series of workshops having listened and, and, and tried to understand what was significant and what was important in their eyes, fleshing that out in some initial design work and then allowing them to respond to those ones to say, well, you know, is this hitting the mark? How would you perceive this? Um, and we got some interesting, uh, interesting responses out of that that we wouldn't have been able to arrive at through our own understanding. One, one example was the, the shades of blue and, and green kind of pastel colours. You know, intuitively, we probably all thought, well, that seems like it would be a calming environment, it would be restful. But what they fed back was every prison and institutional environment is painted in pastel green or pastel blue colours. And therefore, the overriding association for these women is that that is that is the language of prison and that is the association rather than that is a natural because of their own experience. So those little things were really sort of uh, really helpful to us. Um, and the other aspect, which was um, slightly humbling perhaps for the architect who feels like they can design and re resolve the kind of the world's ills was that a lot of the feedback in the, um, uh, in these, consultation um, workshops was that they were much more interested in how were one small thing going to run their service? Would they get access to the caseworker or would that chop and change? And picking up all some of those feedbacks, it's led us to the kind of, kind of conclusion that the architecture will support um, and will resolve through the healing environment etc but but the the architecture had to take second fiddle and support the service that one small thing we're going to run there and therefore we started to reframe the question about how does architecture solve everything to how does architecture best support the service of the client and how they are going to um uh, run run their service how can the building communicate it will communicate because it's a, a very large and prominent sort of aspect but how does it start to build trust between one small thing and the women who first arrive given that it's such a visible kind of piece of communication so you know how does it say you are valued how does it say you are trusted avoiding some of those um uh typical justice um kind of architectural moves of hierarchy by being up on a plinth with formal Greek uh, kind of columns, etc., that start to say, we are above you, we are in power, but actually start to create something that becomes more of a relational approach. And that's, um, I'll, I'll let Paul talk about those aspects, but it was where we were trying to frame the question for how does this building serve? Um, and that then, that design process then continued on. Um, beyond the, the workshops we did with architecture, landscape and interiors, where we were starting to address the big questions around what is this building, how does it look at? And then we that that's then refined, particularly through the engineering disciplines, working with MESH um, around how does this building perform and how will it, how will it work well? Um, and I think the key aspect was that there were a number of very intentional decisions in this project. It wasn't an asset. It wasn't a how much money can we throw at this to make it all better. It was much more important that these decisions were well considered 
and and understood that the, the impact of them and of course that they were resourced at the, the, the same time but it was the sort of clarity of thought and the time taken over those things that, that was important quick bit on the, the sort of the sustainability client was keen that this would be a pioneering project and it would be sustainable from a holistic point of view particularly around the, the social aspects of um uh how does it deal with the whole person um but the they also were keen that the environmental side would be part of a responsible approach to um to building with kind of within community and in society that led them to kind of uh, increase the Briam excellent planning requirement for the project to Briam outstanding and pursue that kind of wholeheartedly, which naturally brought a fabric first approach, but also started to bring in a cross laminated timber. That was a decision taken quite early on, both for its environmental performance, but also for it, the architectural opportunities of bringing so sort of the exposed timber in, into the project. Um, for, for, from, from the interior design sort of benefit. Um, and um, and then it had some of the technologies that's, um, that, that you would expect and that Doug can talk about later on. And then quickly from a procurement point of view, um, full design team um, in order to get a, a sophisticated sort of building through and in order to demonstrate how it met the kind of BRIEM outstanding criteria so that it was well engineered. Um, it started off with a construction management approach in the middle of COVID. Um, we actually changed the decision sort of quite early on in the construction process um, and migrated the project to being a traditional procurement, partly about the scale of the projects, probably partly around supply issues and constructing kind of uh, immediately kind of post COVID um and that's not an easy move to make actually that so some of the procurement actually created sort of a, a number of challenges but you uh you roll with those ones and you move it through but i think it was the right decision to be to, to be taken in hindsight probably it should have been a traditional from the beginning but that was part of the the process of, of testing these things out that probably brings me to the end of kind of my section um uh, and then Paul will take you through the building and the, an overview of that and, and how the trauma informed design started to affect it. I'll pass it across to you now, Paul. That's great. Thank you very much, Mike. I'll um, just share my screen. OK, so um, I'm just going to pick up really and lead on from where Mike uh, left off. Um, Primarily, I'm going to focus on the trauma informed aspects of the project, but I'm just going to give a bit more of an overview of the project itself and give you a bit of a more of a flavor of the of the design and and, and the architectural um, overview. Um, so, as you've seen already, the building's comprised of, of of two parts, a hub at the front and then a residential block at the back. Um, it's important to understand that the context in which this building sits, it sits on a, um, a primary arterial road into the centre of Southampton, quite close to the city centre. It sits in a context that backs onto residential streets and is adjacent to what formerly would have been residential properties within a conservation area, many of which are now converted into small offices and, and, and you know, um, um, non-residential uses. But um, it's, it, it's quite a residential setting onto a quite a busy road with um, it's not really a park, but trees and quite a generous landscape in front of the building. Um, and you can see straight away that it's a building that seeks to fit into its context. You'll probably also notice quite a large building at the back, which up against residential curtilage is, is perhaps um, a little bit odd, not a planning coup on our part. This site already had a building on the site before um, our clients bought it, which had a, effectively a, um, a warehouse at the, at the back of the site, which, which abutted the boundary. So the volumes here, um, at the particular the back of the site are, are very similar to what was previously on the site and that obviously helped with the planning journey. Um, the the overall um, uh, configuration is really just repeated here in, in, in traditional drawings, but um, I want to really focus on, on some of the subtleties of the two parts. 
Uh, so, so the front building is the is 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 key to the project, and the the project is not just residential accommodation within a shared kind of um, co housing environment. It's also um, the offices for the charity, and it is the place where they do their work. Um, it's also a place where they interact with the public through the through the coffee shop and and cafe area. Um, so the hub building is a, is a fairly complex sit, uh, set of public, um, private, and um, office accommodation up on the first floor, um, and then they also own the site next door, which includes um, a, a crash and additional facilities. So it's 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 been quite an interesting sort of series of composite pieces that come together around this courtyard garden that occupies the uh, the kind of heart of the scheme. Um, so the ground floor, um, the hub building at the front is divided into three parts. And effectively, as, you, as you'll as you see in the images from the street scene, it reads as three more domestic scale buildings, but they're actually linked with um, glazed links on the first floor. And then there's a deck access, um, effectively series of apartments um, that, that, that run along the back elevation, quite close proximity to the rear boundary. And that generated some interesting technical challenges around fenestration. And um, you'll hopefully see an image of that later. So the hub building um, divided into three parts uh, with a stair core at the center. Um, the primary entrance brings you into uh, the, the, the cafe and reception area. Um, and then there is a secondary entrance into the more secure um, place where, 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 where women are, are introduced and processed effectively on arrival. Um, and then there is a lounge and um, a residence lounge at the back of the site that opens out onto the garden. Um, upstairs, the um, primary office space is actually very generous. And one of the things that's of note about this building is it is one of the nicest office environments. And there's a number of reasons for that. It's, it shows that the charity really do care about their staff, but I think there's also a direct relationship between the quality of the well-being of the staff and their ability to look after and care for and show compassion for um, the women who come into the site. So there's a load of benefits to that but effectively that top floor as you can see from the roof um, projection um, it's enjoying the vaulted roof spaces and each of these primary larger spaces is top lit as you'll see in some images in a moment another key space at the heart of the building and really at the kind of heart of the the, the whole venture is the hope room and you'll see some images in a moment of the hope room but effectively there is a, um, a very um, well-considered and thoughtful counselling facilities at the back of the site here, which enjoy a view into the, the, um, the garden, but also have a very close relationship with all the administrative facilities. The residential block is effectively a stacking um, series of, uh, of apartments, four apartments on each floor, and um, a deck access serves the uh, first floor with a, a, a covered outside, outside stair. So the building sits really comfortably in its street scene. It's a conservation area. It takes its forms from the context. Um, it, it, it reflects that in its material palette, um, but it's clearly a, a more contemporary interpretation of that. And it's um, it's a, the, the building, particularly the use of zinc, is a contrast to the prevailing materials in the context. But the first impression is one of a building that doesn't draw too much attention to itself. It's, it, it is residential in feel. It is homely in feel and it's not a building that's intimidating when you approach it. It's interesting to note as well that the building sits not far from across the road from the law courts themselves. Um, and so it, it, it is a building which is very different in character to the law courts in Southampton if you were to go and visit them, which have far more of that institutional feel that, uh, that, that Mike was talking to. So here's just a few images of the scheme um, from, the, uh, from the street on the left here. And you can see very much the three domestic scale volumes. Um, the right hand pair is where the entrance is into the cafe. And you can see that sort of generosity of material change, quite a legible entrance. Whereas the, the entrance for those coming in direct often from the courts is a, is a, a more discreet entrance. And they're not brought through that semi-public cafe environment um, on, on first arrival. Um, and that creates a, an appropriate separation of, 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 of privacy and um, gives that sense of um, security as they enter as well. You'll also see the glazed links. So effectively, the whole of the building is operating as one building, but it reads very much as three, three independent pieces. The rear of the building and, and the rear of the, um, of the hub building you can see in the top right 
Um, and again, it's still broken up into three parts, but it breaks down in terms of become slightly more informal in its architectural language. It's got quite generous openings out onto the garden from the lounge, very generous openings from the Hope Room, um, the integrated seat, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. And um, that then dresses onto this quite organic laid out uh, landscape, which creates a series of smaller rooms within what is actually quite a small space. And then there is the um, residential um, uh, accommodation viewed in this bottom image, looking back from the Hope, um, Hope Room, looking back towards the building. So how's trauma-informed design um, influence, influence the building? Um, Mike mentioned that building trust is very important and um, that ultimately at its most basic, and Alain de Botton talks about this, you know, architecture communicates our values. And um, this building definitely says to those who arrive in it, this is somewhere special. This is somewhere that is thoughtful, that is high quality, that is domestic in feel, um, that is potentially one of the nicest environments many people would have been in. You know, from, from, from my point of view, it, it feels more like a really nice one-off house. Um, it feels like a really high quality um, community building. It certainly doesn't feel like an institutional building. It's also quite domestic in its feel in terms of the interior design. You can see the sort of shelves, plant pots, um, uh, de decoration pictures on the wall, very informal reception um, and a feeling of generosity and space, daylight coming down from above. But there are also subtleties in that the, the, the glazing above looking down into reception is actually from the office accommodation and allows an element of surveillance over these spaces. Um, first impressions, I've, I've, I've mentioned a bit about that already, um, but the palette of materials in, is intentionally quite restrained. And in that sense, it's calming, it's not cluttered. Um, it is not seeking to try and draw attention to itself, particularly within the context. Um, and it's intended to sort of settle back into the setting. Um, it's also quite legible. And um, as you get closer to the building and particularly the entrance, the materials change to the timber, which is a dominant material running through the project as a counterpoint to the, um, the uh, buff brick but it's a restrained palette. So there's not a lot going on and it's not a, a building that is busy. Um, it's generally in all the spaces consistent and, and calm. So the, the lounge, um, you can see from this image, very domestic in feel. It is uh, perhaps a little bit bigger than many people's lounges, but fundamentally it has the feeling of a home. It has the feeling of a nice, a nice domestic lounge. And it's a place where people can feel they belong during the time they're there. They can meet others, they can gather. Uh, informally, they can also gather with staff, and it's a place they can begin to feel is, is is in some way their own. They can also importantly retreat to a secondary, more private lounge within their own apartment. And so there are layers of hierarchy of, of uh, offering them the possibility of retreating if they want to, or potentially being a bit braver and, and being willing to mix with others and be more part of the community. Um, key thing here is an institution is in a sense a place where you expect to be processed, this is very much a place people should should expect and will experience a welcome and a level of relationship with the staff that's probably very different to the level of relationship they're normally expecting from uh, in the prison system. It's also a building which is in the community physically by the very nature of where it's sited, um, but also by the fact that it has this opportunity for the public to come in during the week and use the cafe space. That provides opportunities for learning and employment for confidence building, um, it also makes sure that, that the women can remain literally in the community um, at a very practical level during their time in the in the Hope Street. The Hope Room is a really kind of key space at the heart of the project and just an example of some of the different ways in which um, trauma-informed design has influenced the, the, the material selection and the physical design of the space itself. Um, it's a generous top-lit space that, that leads up to a roof light above you. The exposed CLT is materially neutral. Um, it's also materially natural, and of course, there's a there's a there's a smell um, that, that, that that is is very beautiful with 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 all that exposed timber. But importantly, the Lamella MMC is also BOC zero percent, so it is it is a non toxic um, environment, and um, that means that it's a healthy a healthy physically healthy environment. It's also a very acoustically gentle environment, and we've got the AccuPanel on one of the walls, um, which gives that slight subtle change of texture, um, visual texture, but also very importantly, um, softens down the acoustics. 
And then, of course, it's connected to the landscape through a very generous window and um, the connection back to the environment of their own apartment and then the environment they've become familiar with. At the heart of it is the therapy garden and biophilic design was a key uh, influence on the project. And the, and the garden is obviously one of the key places that um, is borne out. Um, it allows them to have direct connection to nature and the views beyond the site, the borrowed views to the trees outside the site boundary also kind of complement that. Um, and it provides a place for reflection and a place to sit in smaller groups and potentially get away and, and be on one's own as well. And just an example of the, 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 the timber lining coming out in the places where people come into contact with the building and just softening that experience down. So what we touch uh, and smell really matters in the building. And um, this I mentioned here, the timber lining to this, to this seating area. But there are also some really nice details. So um, timber door handles and particularly the front door, a big timber door handle. Um, there is um, um, a really nice handrail uh, and, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's a leather clad handrail that, um, that, that, that leads up the primary staircase. Um, and obviously there's the exposed CLT wood ceilings on the, on the first floor, as well as a cork wall and exposed materials within the kitchen dining space. Um, which um, really starts to kind of soften down the, the, the palette and keep it naturalistic throughout. So TNG timber used within the linings within the reception area for the um, where the women are processed when they arrive. Um, exposed timber on the ceilings, again, for acoustics, but also just to bring as much timber into the building as possible. What we hear really matters, uh, both at the level of gentle, soft, um, calming acoustics, compared to the institutional buildings where acoustics are often very hard, often lots of echo, lots of sound traveling, very tiring environments. Hope Street's are very calm, both visually and physically because of the acoustics. And so there is um, acoustic paneling in, in all the primary spaces, but there is also really good acoustic separation. And that, that, that consciousness of privacy when you're dealing with very personal matters of counseling issues, potentially um, quite difficult conversations, that the women can sense that they are in a secure, acoustically private environment is, is very important. Um, this was the, the office space. And I mentioned earlier that really generous, really well naturally lit. Um, there's obviously environmental benefits of that. Um, there are well-being benefits to the staff, but it also clearly is a really nice, lux very luxurious environment in which to work with an excellent connection, both to the um, outside um, and the trees adjacent to the site, but also down to the cafe and to the reception um, and not overly reliant on artificial light. Biophilic design is obviously important to the landscaping, but it's also influenced the, some of the detailing within the building. And this is an example of one of the um, windows that is right up against the boundary on the rear of the property. Um, and it affords a, a view sideways to protect the privacy of the adjoining gardens. And then there is the biophilic um, imprints onto the obscured glazing to um, give something of interest, something that's softer and gentler um, and makes that subtle connection to nature within the bedrooms at the rear of the accommodation block. So the projects um, you know, use that trauma-informed design right, right from the detail, from, from sort of micro all the way up to the macro, um, all the way through the material palette choices, as well as the overall configuration and, 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 and organization of the layout. Um, has it been successful? Has it worked? Well, we're coming to the end of the first year. There is a post-occupancy evaluation underway at the moment, but the responses um, have been really positive. The client, Lady Edwina Grosner, um, is really, really positive responses to the building. Um, we've had uh, quite a successful run so far on the awards front, if that's evidence of anything. But um, the award that I would say really does stand out is the uh, winning the um, the McEwen Award, which is the national award, for, RBA national award for the social purpose project of the year. And um, a really good recognition that this project um, is receiving um, a level of credibility, which is helping the client in terms of their ability to then go on and influence um, policy and to influence decision makers. Um, clearly, it really helps if your project is open by a Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. Um, but that has led, more importantly, to opportunities um, to, to engage with, with, with Parliament and, and to continue the advocacy work that one small thing had been committed to for many years. So it's, so it's definitely the case that the building um, and its approach 
has both aligned with the client's brief, but also has um, continued to allow the client to further demonstrate that their approach is different and their approach is having a positive impact. So I believe actually, before we come to questions, um, Doug's gonna say a little bit more about sustainability. So I will um, stop sharing and then we can come back to questions um, after Doug's presentation. Great, cheers Paul. Um, just whilst I uh, battle to uh, to share my screen, I would certainly um, mirror the, you know, a lot of the comments there and observations that um, both, both Paul and um, Mike have made about the materials and just the feel of the place. I mean, funnily enough, I drove past there just on Monday to go and see another client in the, in the heart of Southampton, maybe only Five six hundred yards away from where this site is, and you have to you have to really struggle when you're driving down the avenue there in Southampton to even pick it out from the. You have to get very very close before you actually see it there. It's certainly not a a striking building, which was which was a key point. But it, but within it, it's uh, you know given some of the some of the the um, you know the kind of the void spaces within the building, incredible. The acoustics are, are are something else, and and it feels very very cozy. It's just just quite an incredible incredible environment i'm usually not one of those people to kind of pick up on that kind of stuff but but definitely very striking as you walk into a building and uh, say compared to a lot of other kind of justice institutions completely the the, the polar opposite so what i just want to spend the, the next kind of five ten minutes talking about is the sustainability aspects um just to mention kind of some of the highlights um and in fact the yeah just a bit bit behind the kind of the strategy just to kind of give you a um a, a feel for it kind of bizarrely the um one of the initial briefs i mean is i mean really is to hide the technology you know although although this is a kind of a sustainable environment nobody wanted to see necessarily solar panels and all the other stuff that kind of makes it sustainable certainly from a technology point of view so there's very little to kind of show from that point of view um and actually the the, the plan views that that i think paul and and mike showed um showed showed a fair idea of on the residential building just how much you know how many solar panels and things there are on the the building at the back there um not necessarily the the, the road facing one but um I'll cover a couple of those points and then we'll we'll open it up to, to kind of questions you guys get to ask um, us, so, you know, kind of what, what you're thinking about. So as as Mike said, this is a pretty outstanding project, you know, not very many projects. I think it's kind of 1% or less, um, you know, are, are, are Briam outstanding. Um, and, you know, that's a high bar to, to, to punch. And very, very early on, you know, when I first sat down with some of the other kind of key stakeholders, including these guys on the call, um, you know, a big part of the brief was this had to be something really, really different. And in order to do that, Brian Outstanding was being, um, you know, was being pitched for. And that very, very, very quickly drove numerically what the building had to do. You know, you had to really, really um, strive to meet some kind of thermal comfort uh, performance of the of the building and, and how we're ventilating it, because... Um, I mean, certainly with the with the technology choices around, uh, sorry, with the building fabric choices around cross laminated timber, and and to be able to drive down operational energy efficiency, the building had to be very very airtight, and that then drove things like mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, certainly during the winter, and then what we did during the summer to make sure that the, the building didn't overheat, and you had big kind of um, kind of uh, void spaces, you know, double height void spaces. Um, also, the embodied carbon, you know, drove some very, very tough targets for embodied carbon by going for BREAM outstanding, the same as water, and I've mentioned operational energy. So the bar was set very, very high and very, very early on. I mean, as far as kind of general ventilation and thermal comfort strategy, um, what, what we were trying to do, and again, this... This this is the kind of the crux here, where you've got very very exposed walls and and the materials that these guys were were trying to build in to to make sure that people using the building really benefited from. You know, you're not seeing services, you're not trying to make it look industrial, um, and and you're putting a ton of effort into passive design, and because of these you know large room volumes, you know we had to carefully think about um, what window openings there were. Again, there was a there was a concern about. Um, you know, safety and security, but getting appropriate levels of ventilation in during the summer months. Um, and I know Richard Bowman, who, you know, has been on Meshwork many, many times before, he was 
key behind the building performance elements of this and and it was a real struggle you know it was it was it was not easy balancing opening windows to the amount of windows to the thermal mass of the building and and, and those seasonal effects were really really tricky um you know what we what we did do uh, was try to maximize opening windows at the very top of these uh, spaces that Paul was talking about you know the office to naturally let air and and uh, you know, heat energy during summer months escape and and, and draw in other uh, fresh ventilation um, to to minimise you know cooling. And it's worth saying there's in this building there is no mechanical cooling whatsoever. There's mechanical ventilation, heat recovery for kind of background ventilation, but there's no there's no cooling um, whatsoever. Um, and in in the residential building um, there is there's also mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, uh, but again making sure these spaces were, were were kind of fairly clear and uncluttered i know um there was talk of the kind of the, the the domestic look and feel of these places but as you might expect you know there's kind of underfloor heating throughout you know there's not radiators everywhere um and th this building was designed for you know very low temperature air source heat pumps both of them were um and even in the you know, kind of the residential building where you've got flats you've got individual um kind of room controls for for temperature there um, as far as the actual kind of technologies that we went in, we went down the uh, air source heat pump route uh, for the entire site. So we had um, in the hub building, which was the one at the front facing the road, we had a, um, a surprisingly small air source heat pump for doing the heating. In fact, um, you know, again, Paul alluded to the fact that although this is a big building, it's kind of split down into three domestic size Kind of homes for want of a better word joined by um joined by links in fact the air source heat pump that heats that entire building is probably the size of a standard three-bed home it, 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 the, the building is so energy efficient it's a tiny tiny heating system proportionally that's gone in to do all the underfloor heating we had a separate uh heat pump for doing the hot water um, and there were elements um, of point of use hot water within those buildings as well. And both buildings benefited from a massive amount of solar PV. So there was 12 kilowatts of solar PV, which I think was about 48 panels or something on the building at the back, the residential building. So the electricity provided, you know, by the, the panels on the back building was, was distributed and used first by electricity or electrical devices in both of those. Um, and in fact, on the residential building at the back, there was also, um, a, a huge amount of south facing solar thermal for doing hot water um, and i'll show you a couple of quick plant room pictures there to, to show you the volume of kind of hot water that was produced and it's worth saying that the hot water storage for this um to date uh the air source heat pump on the residential building um, hasn't had to be used so all the solar energy from electricity and solar thermal has done all the hot water production um, without the need for the for the heat pump having to kind of kick in so I mean there's a lot going on in these plant room photos but you've got two big thermal stores here so we've got a total of about um, 1800 litres of, of water so people can have you know nice long showers should they want to um there's there's kind of solar thermal tucked away in the back here there's you know secondary return to make sure for, for hot water make sure people get hot water uh quickly there's a big break tank and booster set so so you know, again flow to appliances isn't isn't an issue and all the other associated kind of paraphernalia in fact behind where these photos are taken just to the left of this photo on the right um is all the solar pv inverters so by the look of it a fairly standard plant room and, and actually quite a generous plant room um for you know for, for what it was serving um but you know great for you know great for, for maintenance going forward and then just a couple of things on the, the the building itself um the building fabric was super duper tight so kind of passive house levels of, of building fabric really uh, an air tightness of five um and what the design team managed to do was get the uh, the, the hub, which was the building at the front, to better um, partel building emissions by 60%. And the HMO, or the residential building at the back, was 92% better for partel emissions um, than the standard at the, at the time. Um, lots of colours going on here, but as part of this, we did uh, embodied carbon analysis. And this shows um, the different impacts of using cross-laminated timber or concrete frame or gas or air source heat pumps 
And for all of these, the ones that we finally went with was this one in the top left here. So cross laminated timber with air source heat pump, uh, heating and hot water. So the the best, I mean, uh, on, a, on a par with using kind of biomass, but for practicality reasons, we went for air source heating. Um, and and so again, this all this all added to the sustainable to you know, sustainability aspects of the project. You can kind of see the breakdown here, um, you know, by using these different methodologies. And certainly, with the huge amount of wood being used for cross laminated timber, that that they gave some great numbers for sequestered carbon as well. So just as a kind of a wrap up here, you know, there were some tough targets set. Um, We've got current regulations and, and we said this project had to kind of make a difference and this is for embodied carbon right so this is the carbon footprint of the building um, and given the choices that were made about materials and technology um, we managed to punch well 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 above or well 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 below uh, where we should have been so the, to put this into context the reba 2030 target for embodied carbon is 750 kilograms of co2 equivalent per square meter this project halved that again to 354. And there was also another 183 kilos of sequestered carbon within the, the, the kind of the wooden structure. So a massive, massive success from an embodied carbon point of view, as well as a technology point of view. Um, and that point was just on, on overheating. The, the, this picture doesn't really kind of do it justice. Um, but you know, it, it's uh we we got there. Um, and as as kind of anecdotally. It, the building is great during the summer, is nice and warm during the winter, and we'll wait to hear, the, you know, the actual kind of operational um, results from the uh, building, you know, facilities manager and some and some real numbers. But they're looking they're looking good at the moment. So questions, guys. I'll, hand, I'll Simon, I'll hand back over to you as the kind of the compare. I think we just no, about got there with uh, the time to spare for questions. Yeah, no, a couple of few minutes or so. Thank you, Doug. Thank thanks, guys. Really, really interesting presentation. And like, and that's. Whilst the building clearly wasn't, you said it wasn't looking to draw attention to itself, it's clearly a fantastic structure in its entirety. Um, and with the client, you mentioned about how it's this this building serves Southampton. So um, one small thing, are they only focused in that area? I mean, is this a proof of concept for them to to produce more, reproduce this in, in other cities throughout the UK? What's What's the end goal there? Mike, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the um, this is a um, it's a pilot project. the The idea is that you know many women are being sent to prison when they shouldn't be, and they're building more prisons when they need to be building less prisons because it's it's not resolving that. This was uh, funded with um, a lot of um, sort of charity money to put a the cap the the money for the capital project down for it to be tested reviewed it is now running you know just as sort of services so the operation is being funded but in all it's it would be hard for the ministry of justice really particularly in a political climate where justice is moved around quickly to have the amount of time to really try this and and the freedom with it's we've been given which is why once more thing pursued it outside of um the the normal site um the normal kind of route the idea is to then demonstrate it works and to replicate that across the counties meaning that you don't need all these prisons which are not creating kind of kind of great results for society and therefore funding moves from one pot through to to, to another pot uh, and it's better the idea that they're not a 500 bed massive piece is partly because that's not the way to create the community and because the women are not being removed from society they should be relatively local and that's part about remaining there and therefore a network of county based smaller rather than large national facilities is part of the intentional sort of strategy but hopefully they are in conversation with some other um with some of the councils who are keen and have already seen what's what's happened pre results coming out so it should be replicated in other locations. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, I assume, I mean, I was going to ask, I assume something like this wouldn't necessarily happen within the, the traditional state sector and, and require the input of, of the client there. So in terms of sort of um, what one one more question from me before I just go to Pablo's question, but in terms of um, 
trauma um, informed design th this project now i imagine is going to be um the go-to for people to understand how to how to um design a, um, a building of, of this nature using trauma informed design where, where where did you take your influences from did, did are there any other structures within the uk or, or internationally that you that have used trauma informed design for you to pick up on um, uh, so one comment out before Mike talks a bit more about that. The um, it is interesting that it's getting a lot more attention now because there's a growing movement. So there's actually an article which um, may have been in the Sunday Times a couple of weeks ago, and I missed it, or um, is in the Sunday Times coming up. But um, because there's clearly an interest, and it's, it's several buildings in the UK featured in that that apply trauma informed design, and I think the Maggie centres are clearly the something that influenced everyone along has been going for a long time and therefore we, they may not have called it trauma-informed design um but as architects let's be frank we can brand up the same decision making through a number of different philosophies if you like um but that theoretical framework which mike can say a bit more about then in the hands of architects gets applied through the way which we work through the tools we have at our availability and then can be directly attributed back to that intellectual theory, if you like. Um, but whether you call it biophilic or trauma-informed, um, mm. both of them help you. Uh, it is good to have plants and have connections to nature in a building, and you can dress it up in lots of different technical language. Um, but the technical language helps because I think it helps people begin to put a framework around that and begin to get a vocabulary around it and start to get some tools and devices um, which they can use and apply. And I think outside of architectural circles, that theory carries more weight um, because it starts to overlap with other areas of intellectual thought and intellectual understanding of trauma. Um, and so this, in a sense, is just an interpretation of a wider body of work. Um, so, Mike, do you want to say something about the wider body of work that, that there is out there? Yeah, I, I, I think I would uh, agree with that. I in some respects, trauma-informed design is just architects doing a really good job for the specific client that they are tackling with, we happen to be designing a building for those women who would experience trauma. So you're applying the same architectural process of listening to the client working what they really need. It's just that's the group we, we've looked at. But if you start to look around, there are lots of people talking about it, but there's probably not many projects where someone has resourced the project of a sufficient size to really say, how do we apply these principles well and then see how that kind of works? So it is, I think it's getting a lot of interest, particularly because those people who are trying to do these, trying to work in that environment are able to say, ah, here is something that has happened, been resourced. Now let's see how does it work? How did you follow the process? How did you engage in that? And therefore it's, it's pioneering in some respect, partly because it's one of the first few out of the block in grappling with those questions and certainly grappling it under the banner probably of the trauma informed kind of form design. Thank you. Um, specifically, um, Pablo's asked a question about the exposed CLT and how it works with the pipe work, lighting, wiring, skirting, etc. cetera. Um, this is commented that in previously feels that that's been a limiting factor on the use of CLT in the way that you've um, used it. But how, how, how did that, you know, how did you get around these um, these issues? Um, um, I mean, I, I, Mike, you can probably talk talk about the kind of the finishing when it comes to that. I, I mean, I, I would certainly, when we um, when we were planning this out, uh, we th there was a, a huge amount of detailed design that had to go into service penetrations and things structurally through um, you know through some of these elements. I mean, some of the CLT was you know, a foot thick. So, you, you know, you were making this stuff off site and then it was being craned and put together like a jigsaw puzzle when it comes onto site. And I had the pleasure of speaking. I was actually set next to, I mean, both Paul, Mike and myself and, and the rest of the team that contributed to uh, this at the Civic Trust Awards. Um, I was sat next to the guy who headed up um, the, 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 you know, the kind of CLT production. The, the Urban was the, the company that was used. And he was saying it was one of the first projects he's ever worked on where they didn't have to cut a hole anywhere in the structure during on-site. Normally, they have to carve 
you know, somebody's forgotten about some key service and they've got to get their core drills out and, and various things. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of upfront kind of detailed design to be done. But I know, Mike, I mean, we were working um, with, with other guys at, at Snug about getting that detail so that, that nothing was on show. I don't know if you've got any kind of comments about some of the finishing there and how that happened, you know, finally. Um, yeah, I think you're right. It, it, by designing it and fabrication it off site, you do really have to bring the design forward, which is why having a, a full team early on, you can't leave some of the servicing details towards the end because you need to know where, where things are going. As for the challenges of exposing the CLT, I think servicing is one, but you, you can find ways of doing that and, and think about your service runs. Where do you want to expose it? Where is it not going to be exposed? If there are floor voids as well as ceiling voids with, within areas. I think the greater challenge for exposing the CLT in this project was, was fire. Um, and we were designing post kind of Grenfell and that um, that meant that a lot of the legislation around how do you make sure you have a, a safe building, you, you, you had to have a tested system. So you couldn't just say, here is an equivalent product, here's an equivalent product, let's put them together, but it's not a tested system. You now needed to have the whole building tested. And there was a lot of um, kind of gypsum based products that you, we would typically use for fire protection with plasterboard that had been tested for timber frame, but see, but they hadn't been tested specifically for CLT. And because of the glue content within the CLT, you then had to make sure that you didn't have a melting point at other points. So how we were tackling that in that environment where people were rightly concerned about fire post Grenfell but actually hadn't allowed the testing to catch up. So finding the right products and tested systems, speaking to people in, in Europe where CLT is more, more prevalent, that became a greater challenge. And it would have been easier to conceal it all and, you know, and, and find more traditional ways of doing that. But the, the rich opportunity to embrace that in the final kind of result and to find ways of opening up, particularly evident in the Hope Room and some of the other vaulted spaces, was dangling there as an opportunity that um, other colleagues um, at Snug worked very, very hard to find the right systems to, 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 to make that work. Uh, but that was probably the biggest challenge of exposing the CLC. Um, thank you, Mike. Actually, that answers um, most of Ivy's question, actually. He's just posted a question about um, challenges around fire safety, etc. cetera. Um, and Ivy, um, Paul mentioned that they're in the process of uh, uh, post-occupancy study and, and with it being the summer coming up, um, yeah, it will be interesting to hear the results. But I think, and I'm right, anecdotally, um, silence, is, silence is a good thing, is what you said on, the, on, on in the conversation we had previously, that there is no overheating and everything seems to be going tickety-boo and people are finding it a fantastic place to, to work and, and, and live in. Um, guys, we've gone past one o'clock. Really, really, really interesting um, case study. Um, thoroughly deserved your award there. It was um, inspirational. So it was really interesting to hear. And, it, and, so, isn't it? and also it's quite good for Meshwork to touch upon a slightly different angle as well. So I pr appreciate that. Um, I've recorded this session. We'll share, um, it will share, we shared on Meshwork and YouTube, and I'll share it with you guys as well, Paul Mike, so you can do as you wish with it. But no, thanks for your time today. Really, really appreciate you taking time out of your day and uh, been really interesting. And um, speak to everyone soon. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.